Hey, welcome to the audio commentary for the beloved episode 9F10, Marge versus the Monorail. First broadcast, January 14th, 1993. This is Matt Groening. This is Mike Reese. I was the showrunner on this episode. This is Al Jean, the not-so-beloved showrunner. <laughs> <laughs> this is Rich Moore. I directed this episode. David Silverman, supervisor director. And this is Conan O'Brien, popular late-night host <laughs> and author of the episode. I created the character of Bart and Marge. <laughs> Just for this episode. Just for this episode. And then I was ripped off by Matt Groening, who found a time machine <laughs> and went back in time and took credit. Now, well, I'm going to go back in time again and erase this commentary. <laughs> That's yes, what Fox exactly. Legal Affairs is for. <laughs> yeah. we, we were saying... I think when uh, you pitched the idea of doing this monorail show, it was right when you had started working at The Simpsons. And I think Mike and I said, well, I think Jim would think that was too crazy. So we wanted to like, yes. have you a couple ideas that were a little you know, more uh, conventional. And then you sold both those. And then when you came to this one, he loved it. And you looked at us like, you guys don't know what the hell you're talking about. Yeah. This was my third pitch of the day. And this is the one he laughed he, la he liked the other two, and then he laughed really hard at this pitch, and I thought, oh, that's weird. I didn't think he'd go for it, but it was definitely the most out there of the ideas. Hmm. I want to say this is followed almost uh, shot for shot with the Flintstones opening. We ripped it. I mean, we paid loving <laughs> yeah. homage to it. Yeah. Homage <laughs> is an important word mm -hmm. yes, in television. Yes. Just ask Fox Legal. Do you remember where the idea came from, Coney? We call him Coney. Uh, all I remember is I used to... Yeah, you can call me Coney. That's fine. <laughs> there was on Pico Boulevard, which is how I used to get home from work one night. I was leaving the Fox lot late, and I saw a sign for some reason that had a monorail on it. I don't remember what it was for. I don't know why there was a sign there for a monorail, but I saw it, and I started thinking about the town... What's more wasteful and stupid than a monorail? It's such a bad <laughs> sort of late 60s idea of the future. And uh, I thought it'd be funny if Springfield had a monorail and it all kind of came from there. Isn't it ironic? Now you're one of the biggest owners of monorails in the world. <laughs> yeah. I own 15, which makes me the leader. Trump has 11, but he's... I don't know why, why we thought Disney. this was a far-out idea. <laughs> it's, uh... Yeah, why did we think this was so strange? <laughs> this is I remember this episode, in fact, at many points going, we never went this far before. I mean... Yes. Well, also, I remember distinctly when we have Leonard Nimoy, which is coming up later in the episode, but when he disappears at the end of the episode, Star Trek style... I remembered someone saying, we'll never get this through <laughs> because impossible things aren't supposed to happen on the show. But and then everybody was, was away that week when we... <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right. I don't know why. <laughs> oh, Andy Kip. So do you miss the writer's room? Drunk. <laughs> I do. I haven't eaten rancid meat in 11 years. <laughs> I really miss... That's all right, we I saved a lot for you. Yeah, Schwarzwelder's cigarette smoke and... <laughs> We finally all of us down. waiting for an... We'd all wait for an hour for the food to come. Like, you know, we were all making pretty good money, but we were so <laughs> delighted when some crappy food showed up at one. We finally took down that caramel that was stuck to the ceiling. Defile what I defile. You took it down with your tongue. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the Smithsonian now. We should explain yes. that. We're doing this in, in Los Angeles on the Fox lot with headphones on, and, and Conan is in New York, right? And I'm actually shooting an episode of the show right now. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just asked Al Roker to just hold on a second while I shoot this audio commentary. <laughs> He's my lead guest tonight, which is always a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> He's very slim. Well, I think we should remember, I remember my first day at The Simpsons, I was pitching jokes in the characters' voices, and Mike was just staring at me, and I thought that that's what we were supposed to do. So I was going, ah, oh, man, I'm not so sure. And I thought that's what everybody did, but nobody did that. No, that's David Silverman's job. <laughs> Only right. to the animators. <laughs> we went out on a real limb for you, Conan, and you embarrassed us. Look at this. I know. I'm sorry. I look, look at that, old people. I hate old people. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I think this is an element. When people go, what's Conan's imprint on the show? It's, 
He really hated old people. <laughs> and it wasn't just for comedy. He'd go on long rants about them. How much right, they about how they take space. Take space. I want well, this. Well, I remember there's one episode where I wrote this whole thing where, where Grandpa's waiting for his check, you know, from the government. And he's just was like, I don't need it. I don't want it. But if it doesn't come, I'm really angry. Yeah. It also that happens, sums it up, huh? Old people were always saying, I want my check from the gummy mint. And it's like gummy mint. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I remember you were always pitching that they would eat mush. Like, I have yes. a little butter on my mush. Listen, I'm telling you, old people do eat, predominantly eat mush. <laughs> they don't eat solid food. I'm adamant about this. I'm not exaggerating. But isn't that the demographic of your show? Uh, yes. You? We're watched primarily by very old people eating mud. <laughs> are there any other minorities you'd like to sound off against on this DVD no one will ever hear? Old people, sadly, are not a minority. <laughs> the country's aging at a, at a rapid rate. I think we're getting older, in fact. Hmm. Not me, buddy. <laughs> I'm in a hyperbaric chamber as I speak to you right now. So this is, there's a lot of things in this episode which started to start debates in the room. Are we making Homer too stupid? <laughs> I remember at around this time, we did an episode where Homer forgot to make his heart beat. <laughs> and he forgot and then he had to remember and there was another episode where homer got mad at his own mind and his his brain said i give up and walked down a corridor and shut a door and that's when we started to think maybe we're going too far i actually think if you graph the ratings the smarter homer is the higher the show's uh, ratings are we tried to exactly. you know, consciously make them smarter before season 14 and they went up <laughs> Look, see, they're hoisting the old person <laughs> in the background. Well, you do like old people, then. Please. Yes. You know, a town with yeah. money is a little like the mule with a spinning wheel. Uh, no one Lyle knows Langley. how he got it, and dang, Phil Hartman. Knows how you worked with Phil before on Saturday Night Live before you came to The Simpsons, Yes, right? I, I worked with him on Saturday Night Live for a number of years, and I was really happy that he was... I know he did a lot of great stuff with The Simpsons, but I was really glad that he uh, worked on one of my shows, because... He was he was was you know he was amazing he was terrific so it was it was I was glad he was in this episode. You used to talk about how working with him he was like this all the time. Yes, he never really let you in. I, I, I worked with <laughs> Phil for many many years, and Phil would never say, "Hey Conan, listen, I'm a little down today." He would all, every day I saw Phil, every day I saw him at Saturday Night Live, I'd say, "Hey Phil, how's it going?" And he'd go, "Hey you fellas, how are you?" <laughs> All right, then. Keep him flying, boys. <laughs> so he could have been a cyborg for all I knew. <laughs> you know, this he, is he unlike... auditioned for Futurama and came in. I said, you know, you don't have to audition. You have the part. And he goes, no, no, I want to come in. And he came in, and he did a bunch of voices and did a bunch of his characters from Saturday Night Live, Caveman Lawyer and Frankenstein and all the rest. It was really great. Cushy jobs. Were you sent here by the devil? No, good sir, I'm on. I, I was once on the phone with John Lovitz, and he goes, oh, Phil Hartman's calling me. I'll put him on. And it was like, hi, Al, it's Phil. I <laughs> 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 it's just like being on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> yeah, he would always put on a show. Always, you know. I have the voice of reason, Marge. <laughs> <laughs> now, I always loved the Music Man and really wanted to do this Music Man thing. And then a couple of years ago, I was offered the part of the Music Man on Broadway. You were? Thought, really? Yes. They asked me to come in because the, <laughs> they wanted someone. I swear to God, this is true. They, they offered it to me. Bierko had left and the show wasn't. Craig Bierko had done it. Right. And they called me up and said, can you do it? And there was, there was no way I could do it. But it would have been, it, it just seemed like a message from God. Because it, it, had been an obs it had been an obsession of mine. And I had pretty much done a Simpsons episode, the first half of which is built around the, the Music Man. And, you know, it just felt like this would be perfect. I'd love to do the Music Man. But there was just no way I could do it. Well, your whole talk show is a scam on NBC, right? You're just hmm. going to leave one night and yes. take everything? Yes. I'm, <laughs> I'm, <selling mu> <laughs> I'm selling musical instruments. <laughs> Young lady, that's the most intelligent question I've ever been asked. Really? Oh, I could give you an answer, but the only ones who'd understand it would be Wait, you there was an awkward me. silence right there. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start over. We, we, can, we can edit that out.
Next question. We're just going to fill that with laughter. So this again, this is stolen footage. Because Conan couldn't write us a whole episode. <laughs> yeah. So we used old footage. There's an enormous amount. I mean, it was a great, great show. I think it killed the first reading. Am I right? It was a very big read, yeah. Very, very popular. This the, the, the episode. The first reading with the cast. This really episode? Oh. Yeah. But it, it wound up really short. And viewers will see when it's every trick in the book is used to get this episode to length. <laughs> But Fox has solved that problem now where we have uh, less show and about a minute more commercials. Monorail conducting by enrolling at the... Well, this is one of the most... But uh, we get the money. <laughs> <laughs> the money goes to everyone involved in the episode. This was one of the more difficult episodes that we ever did, I think, just from an animation point of view. Right, Rich? It just yeah, this, so was, many things. this was the beginning of the, the big shows. <laughs> right. I remember it being blown away when the animatic came back for this episode i was sh I, I i was shocked at how obviously how much work had gone into the monorail and the action sequences i mean it, it just it came out much better than i would have ever have imagined it you know it it it, uh, it was really impressive especially the big action scenes where the monorail's whipping around the town i i often watch that those segments and uh, and touch myself. <laughs> God bless so animatic is one of those technical terms. Are there uh, technical terms uh, for your talk show? That yes. We that we wouldn't know about. Yeah, when it's in the crapper, that means it's not going. That means it's not going well. That guy was a stiff means that was a bad guess. As in Al Roker was a stiff. <laughs> Who will never listen to this? There's commentary. lots of. Yeah, there's lots of terminology. <laughs> uh, when the show goes nowhere, it means it seemed aimless and had no real center. <laughs> Should write these down and have and, a website. But ironically, me pulling a boner is actually me becoming erect during the show, <laughs> not making a mistake. <laughs> this is interesting. This is the first. This is the first episode where we see Homer and Marge in their bedroom. This has never been seen. <laughs> I just like to throw some stuff in there so real Simpsons fanatics will get angry. <laughs> that is not true. It's been shown many times. The chicken, it had no bones. You remember we were talking this about this yes? on an earlier... Boy, talk, we didn't have that. That was black. Black screen. That was great. That, that yeah, I, I, I thought it was done. <laughs> We had a five-minute still of Conan in the show originally. <laughs> Do you remember doing the Butterfinger BB Man? This is one of your great room characters. What was Butterfinger BB Man? <laughs> you invented a corporate shill who was trying to sell Butterfinger BBs to kids. And he, he was oh, yeah, like Lyle yeah. Langley. Right, right. No, I think my most popular room character was I used to come in and fill my mouth with Coca-Cola and then start vibrating, which would make the foam drip out of my mouth like I was having a fit. <laughs> and you guys loved me, to, and you'd call me in. I'd be downstairs writing an episode. You'd call me up and make me fill my mouth with Coca-Cola. I think what we said, we'd, go say, into a... we'd say dance, monkey, dance. <laughs> dance, yes, dance, monkey, dance. <laughs> and you'd all break out in accor accordions, and I would uh, do my little bit. It's called Fit Man. Um, Is this true? Yeah. I don't remember this. I feel yes, like I suppressed yeah. this memory. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did. I used to twitch, and the foam would come out from the soda would come out my mouth. And, and that's, that's what we told Conan. There uh, was by a, the way, the, right on the show. <laughs> well, bye. I don't know why I leave this lying around. The line when they show the possums and the big one bitey. I call the big one bitey. Yeah, I, I I call the big one bitey. I can't tell you how many times after you know practically eleven years of me doing a late night show, <laughs> and I think being known for other things. How many times young <laughs> yeah, mostly young men come up to me and go, "Dude, I call the big one bitey." <laughs> That's a pretty good line. Uh, that that line really resonates with people. And this one, See, another, another old stupid person. old person. <laughs> that line resonates. Look, old person is crazy. Go away. Well, that Bring sign says something island. different. <laughs> <laughs> this is the so, Max von Sydow character. We're trying to. I swear there was a movie that somebody saw. Yeah, I went. I looked it up on the net. I couldn't find anything he was in I or don't, Maximilian Schell. It wasn't. I will say that there was no. It was not meant to be anybody at, you know, at my stage, unless someone on the design stage, the directing, you know, added something later on. But I, it was never, from my end, meant to be anything but generic wacky scientist. 
Rich, do you remember? I seem to remember in the script that it said like a Max von Sydow type, you know. Well, maybe somebody maybe, else had but, that. You know, I could have been drunk. Ladies and gentlemen, hey, Rich, there's you. I was uh, in the back. Look at that crowd. It's this like they're alive. Look, that, that Conan's yeah. talking. Animation. Everybody quiet. Conan's yeah. talking. <laughs> no, this was, uh, you know, just supposed to be an homage to, I loved bad disaster movies of the uh, mid-70s. You know, anything with George Kennedy in it. <laughs> and and this was supposed to just, you know, they always began very optimistically and then uh, something went wrong. And so this is supposed to be that kind of... It was sort of starts off Music Man and then supposed to go into this. <laughs> yeah, I almost killed myself when I heard about it. The first time. <laughs> I'm directing a show that's uh, Music Man. Because I remember you were trying to get it. Irwin Allen. <laughs> there was a song, I think, from the Towering Inferno you wanted in the uh, show. Yeah, yeah. There well, this more... is the biggest. This is the biggest story. Was this was originally when I wrote the episode, the guest star was supposed to be George Takei. From Star Trek, and we contacted George Takei, just certain that he would do it because you know this was after Michael Jack. I mean, everybody was killing themselves to get on The Simpsons, and we contacted George Takei, and he told us he wouldn't do it because he was on the San Francisco Board of Transportation, and he didn't want to make fun of monorails. <laughs> and we were just stunned, and then I was heartbroken, and then I came in uh, to work, and I think Al, you said, "Hey, we just got a phone call. George Takei won't do it." But Leonard Nimoy will. And I remember just thinking, that's better. That's, that's perfect. <laughs> it was, and we actually, we did a rewrite for George Takei to address his concerns. To show, yeah. Just putting in all <laughs> Which these actually plugs hurt. for mass transit. Well, no, what I was going to say was like, I'd want to make sure the monorail doesn't look dangerous. <laughs> no, it was about how dangerous. No, it was, no, yeah, the whole thing was it's dangerous. He was like... Fine. If uh, if you could just uh, redo the episode, <laughs> I come off as liking public transportation. You know, and so we eventually, we called him up. I think I called him up and just said, hey, you're out. Spock's on the bridge. He's taking control. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't appreciate that. Who directed him? Who directed uh, Nimoy? Anybody here? I was there. I don't remember uh, specifically... Um, I think he directed himself. I was there with, I was there with, yeah, he directed himself. And then Shatner came in. (laughs) Took over. Because Shatner turned us down the first season, right? Shatner's turned us down several times. He's never done the show. Wow. Well, he He won't do just anything. That's Futurama, right. How fast are they going? That was a great shot. I was going to say. Well, judging by your husband's cowardly (laughs) This shot amazed me when I saw it. I just thought this was really cool looking. How about that? (laughs) Yeah. And that that shot amazed me. I was also amazed that you guys had a still of Quimby. (laughs) (laughs) How about the way it spells out mayor? Can't can't mistake who he is. (laughs) This was a commentary on bureaucracy's inefficiency and the infighting that hurts us all at the end. <laughs> so true. So I like true this for everything. came d- during a rewrite while we were actually directing the show. This whole scene came down to the floor. Yeah. And I thought it was nuts. I had to direct it, and the cast is looking at it. What is it? But it was really funny. <laughs> it was really yeah. funny. It came out of the blue. <laughs> hey, Conan. Yes. If, if you hadn't gotten the call from NBC, if you hadn't gotten a talk show, you'd still be at The Simpsons, right? Yes. <laughs> Probably. I was a sweet, it's a sweet gig. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd have come up with many more aimless, go nowhere room characters like Butterfinger, Doctor, and, you know. Do you remember the hydrogen peroxide guy? <laughs> yeah. I remember it. I remember my favorite, one of my best pranks ever is the everybody at the <laughs> Simpsons just couldn't wait for lunch to come. And they'd know lunch was coming because an intern would kick the screen door open. <laughs> And, and and walk in with a bunch of boxes and everybody would stop working and start gorging themselves on hamburgers and fried, you know, you know, fried French fries, whatever, and milkshakes. And so one day I just snuck out of the room. I, th- I think I said I was going to use the bathroom and I got a whole bunch of boxes and I just kicked the door open and walked in and I was obscured by the boxes and everybody went, yay, because it had taken so long. And then I dropped... I dropped the boxes, and it was just me. And I said, lunch isn't here, you asses. And then, uh, everyone hated me after Didn't that. Didn't I start chewing on your leg? <laughs> you did. 
it really was a Pavlov situation. Everybody no, now was we have a cowbell, and... a literal cowbell that we ring, and uh, somebody had a, a fake cowbell that they rang like 20 minutes early, and that really got people mad. <laughs> We're so See, hungry. that's ripping me off. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they're mad about. Anyone can just. Anyone can just ring a cowbell, but to actually leave the room and get boxes. In my day. Think harder, Homer. <gasps> you know what? I never knew what Homer's uh, monorail outfit was going to look like. <laughs> but I have to admit, when I finally saw it, Gorgeous. I thought, yeah, we went, we went too far. <laughs> well, the other thing so we were ridiculous. talking about was just we had written this into a corner where he had to stop this runaway monorail. I don't know. Right. He quite, quite had the most logical <laughs> conclusion. Well, I think that, you know, of course I love anything bursting into flame for no reason. So this really well, watch this. always makes me laugh. <laughs> and uh, this affliction is really funny to me. So, uh, <laughs> Look at that. Well, in, in, the initial draft, they both, in the initial draft, they both bleed to death. Right there. <laughs> that was... Oh, you call that an anchor? No, the, I thought one of the really good lines, which isn't mine, I, I don't know whose it is, but when the when the eclipse occurs and... No, when they say, we can't stop it, it's solar power. And someone says, when will people ever learn? <laughs> uh, solar power. I, I forget who that who that is, but that was a great line. That's Almost everything think, Leonard right? Nimoy said really cracked me up. Yeah. Right. And the way he said it, he well, took it is, so seriously. He was a great yeah. sport. We brought him back for the X-Files episode, which we, we really almost never do bring back a guest star. Right. But he, was such, he was so funny. And... <laughs> See, this right here. I remember someone telling me this will never get through. He can't disappear because on The, the Simpsons is not. It's, you know, it's, it has to be true to life. And then look at this whole ending. Yeah. <laughs> this no, whole ending. It's just never literally broke the show. You came in for a year. You screwed us up. And you split. And I split, and... We could be king yeah, of the hill this. right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there I go. There's David Silverman. <laughs> and somebody else. Very nice. Whoa. Well, any Look parting all shots? These <laughs> Before, all uh, dead now. Hank Azaria. <laughs> 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 no, it was... Uh, I remember that was the third... That was the third episode I pitched my first day, and, and being really, that was my favorite idea, but I, I wasn't sure it would go. But What were uh, the other two? Do you remember? Do it was you know? Lisa, no. the one that became Lisa's rival. Oh, yeah. Lisa's rival, I think. Was that it? Yep. Oh, yeah. And, and, and Marge That's... gets her job, which uh, Oakley and Weinstein wound up writing. Well, I remember. That's right. And then Homer, Homer goes to college, I guess I pitched at a different time. Yeah. That was a separate pitch meeting. What I remember about that, it was your first one, and then we said, oh, one would be good, two would be great, and then you came out. I did three. There was no stopping you. <laughs> and there was a little gong that they gonged. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs>